hello everyone and welcome to our informational webinar about Fielding's APA accredited PhD in clinical psychology program. My name is Brian Wallen and I'm the admissions advisor for this program. And today we are joined by our program director, Dr. Connie Vize. Today, Dr. Vize will talk us through a little bit more about the program details. Then she'll pass it back to me to go over more about the application process and tuition for the program. And then we'll close up the presentation today with time for questions and answers. Thank you everyone for being here today. Dr. Vize, if you're ready to get started, you can go ahead and take us away. Okay, yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I'm the program director for our clinical PhD program. And we're gonna start with just a brief overview of clinical uh, and counseling psychology. Clinical psychology is the branch of psychology that integrates theory, research, and practice to address the causes, assessment, and treatment of psychological disorders. And counseling psychology focuses more on the well being over the lifespan and on vocational issues. Um, historically, these two programs developed out of different departments uh, within universities. So, clinical psychology came out of departments of philosophy and psychology. Eventually, they had psychology departments, and clinical was an aspect of that while counseling psychology programs were developed in departments of education. And still today, you find these programs housed in these two different departments. Um, at the doctoral level, uh, if you get a license in clinical or counseling, technically you're licensed to do the same things uh, at the doctoral level, but clinical is still focused on mental health and treatment um, differences there. Okay. The PhD and the PsyD are the two highest degrees you can get in clinical psychology. Uh, and again, at the doctoral level, once you get them and you get licensed, you can do the same thing. But a PhD is a doctor of philosophy degree, again, coming out of departments of philosophy and psychology, and there really is a strong focus on research. Uh, so in clinical psychology, the doctoral degree will the PhD degree will prepare you to practice, to do research and to teach. Um, and so it, it gives you, you know, a breadth of things to do in your career. Okay, um, now let's kind of look at our program. We are an APA accredited program. Uh, we're the only distributed APA accredited program in clinical psychology. And we have basically, you can think of the structure of our program along these three pillar, pillars, as I call them. We have an academic component, we have a clinical component, uh, and we have a research component. And our, our um, goal is for you to be competent uh, in all three of these areas. So the academic component is focusing on core knowledge areas in psychology. And these are the core knowledge areas that APA has said um, that they want all students with doctoral degrees in psychology in general, not just clinical, to be competent in these academic knowledge areas. These are the core discipline specific knowledge areas for clinical psych. Um, and then the clinical component and the academic component is of course courses. The clinical component, we have clinical courses and then we also have um, applied experiences where you actually get hands-on training doing clinical work. The courses and training, uh, we have psychotherapy classes where you're introduced to the theory uh, of psychotherapy or, or psychology. And we have courses uh, in the three kind of major theories of cognitive behavioral, psychodynamic, and then humanistic. Uh, we have courses in psychological assessment. You learn to do intellectual assessment, personality assessment. And then we have these practicum case seminars, which are courses you take where you bring your cases from your applied practicum into the classroom to talk about and, and you learn how to apply theory to the, your casework. We have two main applied experiences for clinical training. And the first is practicum. You have to complete a minimum of 1,520 hours of practicum 
uh, which happens starting in year two of the program and goes through years three or four. In order to meet those hours, if you want to be on a five-year plan and complete the program in five years, you have to do 15 to 20 hours a week. Practicum cannot happen where you're employed or, or where you've done a previous kind of uh, master's level practicum experiences don't count. You have to be supervised by a doctoral level psychologist doing doctoral level uh, work. Uh, okay. And then internship is a one year full-time placement where you do it in either year five or six, depending on your progress through the program. And internships are competitive. You have to apply through APIC. And the whole program uh, is kind of designed, to, the clinical training, your academic training is designed to get you to be a good applicant for internship. It's like the capstone, internship and dissertation are like the capstone experiences for your doctoral degree. Um, there may not be an internship in your area. Uh, if you live in a major city, there's probably more than one. And so you can look at apic.org to see where there are internships. Okay, the research component, again, there's courses and applied experiences. We have all the basic statistics and research courses. One way that we are actually um, good is that we offer research methods, both qualitative or quantitative. You can specialize in qualitative if you decide to do that. Um, we also have applied experiences. We have a research practicum where you do research with a fielding faculty member, and that results in either a poster presentation or a paper, and then we have your dissertation. So if you look at how these components fit together, uh, the program cannot be completed in less than five years, and in your first two years, which is the case in most clinical PhD programs, we really try to get that academic coursework out of the way. You may have a few academic courses that spill over into year three and four, but the majority of your heavy coursework should be done in the first two years. By the end of year one, you're starting your research practica, and at the beginning of year two, you're starting your clinical uh, practicum. Pra so, in year four, if you're on this five-year plan, you would apply for internship in the fall and finish up your dissertation. And then on year five, you actually go away to your internship. And when you're finished with internship and dissertation, you graduate. Most people spread out the program over six years. And that's for you know a variety of reasons. Most students who come into fielding um, are adult learners who have jobs, family, life commitments, and they can't devote the time to progress through the degree. Um, even though we are distributed and we have flexibility in our learning, it is a full-time graduate program. And if you can't devote a significant, you know, devote all of your time basically outside of uh, your family obligations or personal obligations, if you can't treat it like a full-time job, it might take you an extra year or two to finish the program. Okay, so that, that's how we're similar or the same as all other uh, APA accredited programs. What are some things that, that makes fielding distinctive? And, and the big one I know that draws a lot of people is our distributed learning model, which we're not, we are not online only. Uh, we have learning experiences that happen at a distance uh, via the internet and Moodle, and but we also have in-person learning that you have to engage in, and we'll talk about that. At Fielding, the average age of an incoming student is about 36 years old, so we treat our students as colleagues or junior colleagues. We fully expect you're going to be a doctor uh, like us, and we appreciate all the experiences you're bringing into the program. And there is a strong emphasis at fielding as a whole on social and ecological justice. Uh, and we encourage students to develop that value in their work. Okay. We do allow you to develop your own area of research uh, and professional interest um, as if you would go to a traditional brick and mortar PhD program, 
you would have to fit your research interests with the faculty's ongoing interests. But at Fielding, we allow you to develop your own area uh, of interest. And uh, we also have these concentrations that where you can uh, decide to take courses in forensic health, neuropsych, or social justice. Uh, and they involve courses and research work, and some of them involve practicum as well. If you decide you don't want to do a full concentration, you can uh, just take the, like the, if you're interested in health and social justice, you could just take the main course in each of those areas. Okay, our educational model is a competency-based distributed learning model. And competency-based just means we focus on outcomes. We're not just focusing on grades per se. We want to see that you can develop scholarly writing skills. We want to see you get a publication, which shows that you're competent in research. Uh, we want to see you, that you are competent in your clinical skills. You can develop a relationship with a client. You can write an integrated assessment report. We have courses in that. We, we want to see the outcomes. But like I said, distributed means in person and at a distance. So our, uh, if you enter into fielding, we are a year long uh, model. We have three terms that fall, that go over the entire year. We have fall, spring, and summer term. Fall term is from September through December. Spring term is from January through about May. April, something like that. And summer term is May through uh, the beginning of August, the beginning middle of August, which within each of these terms, we have what we call sessions. And these are one week in-person sessions. Uh, in November, in fall, we have a fall session, which happens in November, which we have the East Coast it's, it has been in Baltimore, but this year is actually going to be in Minneapolis. And winter session is in January. Uh, it's always in January in Santa Barbara. It's usually right at the beginning of spring term. And then in summer, we have a summer session, which is July, somewhere in the Midwest. This year, it's happening in Cincinnati. We also have professional development seminar meetings, and these are geographically based, which happen one weekend day a month over 10 months. And we'll look at a map of the United States, kind of looking at where our PDS, PDS seminars are located. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, you go and you meet with a professor who's in that geographical region, who's your faculty advisor for a day and they help guide you through the program at those PDS meetings. You may see research presentations from other students. You'll do case presentations. You'll you observe your colleagues' case presentations, et cetera. And then you also have in-person practicum experiences and clinical practicum. So that's the in-person. And through residential session and these PDS meetings, you have to accrue 600 hours of in-person time with a fielding faculty member over your course in the program. And that's about 150 hours a year over the first four years. Then the learning at a distance, you have courses, for example, our psychopathology course, which is totally semester-based and they happen over Moodle. And you'll have Zoom meetings for the class like we're having tonight. Uh, so if you so for fall, most people take psychopathology their first year in the fall. You, you would be in that Moodle course from September through December, working on your assignments, going to Zoom meetings, submitting papers, et cetera. Nothing happens in person. Okay. Our classes are delivered. Some of them are totally in person, like we just like going to session, you might take a research class on how to use SPSS. That's a totally in-person two-day class that happens at one of those sessions we talked about. Distance courses or psychopathology like we just talked about. And there are some courses that are a combination where you go to session and you have a Moodle component the entire semester. And one example of that is the course, it's 710B, where you learn to do the WACE. 
Uh, you do some hands-on stuff at session, and then you do a semester-long Moodle-based course. So it's a combination. This is what a sample, uh, your sample first year would look like. So for fall, you have to complete our online, our new student orientation online and in Santa Barbara. And that happens at the very, it happens the summer before you enter and at the very beginning of fall term. And then you would take these three courses uh, and then you also would attend your professional development seminar meetings. Uh, for the spring term, you may decide to go to winter session and these are the three courses you would take and you could take these two courses at winter session. Uh, this is that waste course I was talking about. So you would go to winter session and do two days and then uh, throughout the rest of the term, you also would have work to do. And this is what summer term might look like. If you went to summer session, you could take 710C, which is the MMPI class and some research skills classes. Okay. These are our PDS locations. Um, and then this is what they look like on a map. So when you apply to fielding, you need to choose the geographical location that is closest to you. Uh, and these are those locations. Okay, some other information is we've been accredited since 91. Uh, like I said before, you are a full-time student. Sometimes people think, oh, it's distributed, it's online, it's flexible, it's not gonna take a lot of my time. It's going to take a lot of your time. Uh, different, there'll be different times where you have to do less or more work, but overall it's a very time intensive program. You can transfer in up to 12 graduate credits, uh, which doesn't impact the length of your program. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Brian to talk about the application process. Thank you, Dr. Vizé. Now, before jumping into the application process itself, I do want to talk a little bit more about eligibility to apply to the program and some of our application deadlines. So the minimum eligibility to apply to the program includes a conferred bachelor's degree, and you do have to have a minimum GPA of 3.0 from a regionally accredited college or university. We do also require that um, you are currently residing within the United States or Canada for the duration of the program. And that's in order to participate in those in-person events and to, to continue through your clinical training components. Now, if your GPA is below a 3.0, you can use graduate level coursework to supplement that undergraduate GPA. If you completed a degree outside of the United States, um, you can still apply to the program. That's okay. We do just require a course by course international degree evaluation from an NACES approved organization that shows US GPA equivalency, as well as individual letter grades on your transcripts. I do want to point out that Canadian degrees do also have to be evaluated. We do have more instructions available on our website as well, and our link is there on this slide for you. Now, those are our minimum eligibility requirements to apply to our program, but we do also have two separate application deadlines that each have slightly different eligibility requirements. So we have an early decision eligibility um, with an early decision application deadline on November 1st of 2022 to receive a final decision of admission by February 1st, 2023. That early decision deadline does require a minimum GPA of 3.5, and that GPA has to come from your bachelor's degree or a psychology post-baccalaureate certificate program. Master's GPA cannot be used to meet this early decision requirement. Additionally, a minimum of four transcripted psychology courses have to be included on your transcripts. Uh, and that psychology designation means that it has to have the psi uh, abbreviation there on your transcripts. At least two of those four courses must be in statistics and or research methods. 
coming back to our standard decision eligibility here, um, this aligns with what I, I talked about before in that previous slide, but the application deadline is on February 1st, 2023 to receive a final decision by April 15th, 2023. The standard decision requires a minimum GPA of 3.0 from your bachelor's degree, um, and that GPA can be supplemented with a master's degree or psychology post-baccalaureate coursework. Although our standard decision application deadline doesn't have specific coursework requirements, we do still recommend coursework in psychology. Courses like statistical methods or research and advanced research methods are, are very helpful. Additionally, psychopathology or abnormal psychology coursework is, is very helpful for that standard decision deadline. So, our minimum eligibility requirements are, are what you need to, to be able to apply for each deadline, but it, the program is very competitive, so it's important to, to strive to surpass those minimum requirements. Applicants strongly benefit from experience as a volunteer, help provider, or psychotherapist, and even more importantly is that applicants benefit from experience with psychological research through both coursework and hands-on research experience as a lab or research assistant. Research experience tends to be the most common reason why applicants are turned away from doctoral programs, so it's very important to, to have that kind of experience. To learn a little bit more about uh, your, your competitiveness for the program, how to stand out in, in your application, we do have a couple of really helpful application workshops. These are recorded webinars all about how to stand out in your application to APA accredited programs. I have two links here on this slide. The first one is, do you have what it takes and what to do if not? This one is all about giving you more perspective into what APA accredited doctoral review committees are looking for in their applications and what you can do to really stand out in your application. The second is avoiding the kisses of death in clinical psychology doctoral applications, and that one takes the opposite approach in telling you a little bit more about what to avoid in your application, what some of the common pitfalls are in, in applications. Sometimes people include something in their application that they think is a strong point, but it actually uh, is, is a, a point that, that can, can be quite devastating in your application. So it, it sheds some more light into what some of those things are. I really encourage everyone to take a look at these webinars. They're really helpful, not only for Fielding's application process, but it'll be helpful if you're applying to other APA accredited programs as well. All right, so getting into the application process itself, um, the application process on the left hand side of this slide you'll see is broken down into three parts. First, there is a general application review of all completed applications. If you move through that first round of review, you are invited to interview. Now, interviews are done with the faculty member who runs your PDS or professional development seminar location um, that we looked at at that map before. So it's really important that when you apply to the program, you keep in mind that location. That's something you'll select in the application and that you select the location that is closest to you or easiest for you to attend. Students typically attend about five of those per year and are really encouraged to attend as often as possible. After all interviews are completed, we issue final decisions. If you apply for that early decision deadline on November 1st, you'll have your decision by February 1st. And if you apply by February 1st, decisions are typically made by about the middle of April. Looking at the application itself, it is done entirely online, and there are more instructions about each of these components within the application portal itself, and you can log in and out of this application portal as needed all the way up until your respective application deadline. It's free to get started, and additionally, normally there is a $75 application fee. But if you have joined us live here today or if you're watching this recording, you can just let us know by email if you're watching the recording and we'll get you a, a fee waiver for the application. And if you've joined us today live, that fee waiver has already been applied to your account, so you won't be prompted for payment when you go to submit your application. Now there's an online application form to complete. There's also a couple of supplemental materials that we have you upload as a PDF copy. So we have you provide a statement of purpose a critical thinking writing sample, and we have you upload your curriculum vitae or your CV. 
Now the statement of purpose and the critical thinking writing samples do both have specific prompts to follow. So be sure to take a look at those prompts and write according to what those prompts are asking for. And, uh, and you'll wanna take a look at those before you get started. We also have you have official transcripts sent directly to fielding from your previous institution, or if you're completing an international transcript evaluation, you'll send official, you'll have official transcripts sent directly to the evaluating agency, and then that agency will send them directly to fielding. We require official transcripts for your undergraduate degree at a minimum, but it is helpful to have any related coursework sent to us as official transcripts. So it's really best that all of your academic history is sent over to us. And then finally, we do require three letters of recommendation. And how the letters of recommendation work at Fielding is we have you enter in the names and contact information for your recommenders into the application portal. As soon as you enter in all three of your recommenders names and their associated contact information and you click save and continue, an email is automatically sent out to those recommenders with more instructions on how they can provide a letter of recommendation and a link to upload that letter. We do uh, allow recommenders to upload a free form letter as a PDF copy, uh, and we just ask that it's provided on official letterhead. Now, fielding doesn't require the GRE for any of our programs or any other type of entrance examination, and we never have, so, um, so no, no need to worry about the GRE there. So tuition and funding for the program, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slides, but I do want to point out we do have an Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships. If you ever have questions about these components, feel free to get in touch with them directly. They're very helpful. You can reach them by email at finaid at fielding.edu. So the tuition for this program is a flat rate per term, and that's 9,700 per term, and that's independent of how many credits you're taking in any given term. So if you take an extra class, you don't have to pay any more for that class. Again, we have three equal terms per year. We do run year round, so the annual cost comes out to about 29,100, but this tuition is more weighted at the beginning of the program because we do have a few cost reductions as you progress through the program. So when you reach the stage of advancement to doctoral candidacy, you do receive a 30% tuition reduction. That's usually at about the start of the fourth year of the program if you're on the five-year track. And then again, when you reach the, the doctoral internship in the last year of the program, your tuition is reduced by a total of 80%. So taking into account both of those reductions, the estimated total tuition for the program comes out to about 114000 Students utilize several methods to cover their tuition. So we'll cover a few more of these methods here. Fielding does offer some scholarships for the program, although Fielding doesn't offer full funding for this program. So scholarships can't cover your full tuition. It's always best to have a plan in place to cover the full tuition for the program. And then any scholarships you're awarded can just offset those, those, that plan to make it a little bit easier for you. As an incoming student, you are automatically considered for scholarships as long as you complete your FAFSA by the program's application deadline. Or if you're an international student um, and you're not eligible for the FAFSA, you can complete an international need assessment form and um, you can contact our financial aid team to, to get that form and, and fill that out. Our Provost Achievement Scholarship is based primarily on financial need, which is why the FAFSA or International Need Assessment Form is required to be considered. Those, that scholarship typically ranges between about $500 and $3,000, and that's awarded for the first term of the program. As a continuing student, though, we do have more, many more scholarships available, and scholarships tend to be a little bit more weighted as you progress through the program towards, towards the end of the program when you get more into the research components of the program. As a continuing student, you'll be able to utilize our common scholarship application, which will populate all of the scholarships that you're eligible to apply for and make it nice and easy for you to apply for those scholarships. You can apply every single term, regardless of any previous awardings. Many students also utilize personal resources to cover the tuition. And if, you're, if you have that plan in mind, you can pay tuition by term up front at, before the start of the term or by year for the full year, year's tuition. 
We also offer a monthly payment plan that does have a $50 activation fee, but then your tuition for each term is broken down into four equal payments to each month of that term. We're also happy to work with veterans and their benefits, and our Office of the Reg Registrar does take care of, uh, of our veterans' benefits. So if you have any questions about that, you can also contact them at registrar at fielding.edu. Finally, our program is fully eligible for federally offered aid. And because our program is APA accredited, it does meet the health professions programs criteria. So there's typically much more aid available for, for this APA accredited program than a, than a typical graduate program. Now to be eligible for federal student aid, you do need to complete a FAFSA and you can do that at studentaid.gov and have it sent to fielding using fielding school code. Our school code is G is in golf 20961. And we do ask that you complete your FAFSA by the program's application deadline so that you can be considered for those scholarships as well. At the graduate level, federally offered aid is typically in the form of student loans. So the, there's eligibility for direct unsubsidized loans, which, um, which has a, both an annual limit and a lifetime limit, and it, that does depend on your previous borrowing history. There's no credit check required for that. And then when you do graduate from your program, there's a six month grace period before you have to start to repay. There are several different types of repayment plans available, including income based repayment plans as well. If you need additional aid beyond that, that direct unsubsidized loan, there's also the Graduate PLUS loan, which doesn't have a, a lifetime maximum, and you can receive aid through the Graduate PLUS loan up to your, your total cost of attendance. So that includes things like any travel expenses, it includes things like room and board, and, and so on, in addition to the tuition. Um, so that is available for you as well there that does typically require a credit check but that's a soft inquiry that is mainly looking for for major major credit issues um, such as a, a bankruptcy or foreclosure things like that there are also income-based repayment plans available for the graduate plus loan additionally we are happy to work with anyone who wants to utilize private student loans um, those do also tend to require a, a credit check and those tend to be a, a harder credit check yeah. 